Uh, it is the time for the final session of this very powerful conference, the session on the feminist peace principles, and we are looking uh, forward to sharing some of the very useful and important insights and recommendations with all of you. And this is something that, as I said this morning, I've been talking about for two and a half days. So uh, I will not speak more about this session. I will just stop here and hand it over to the Anna Karin for, uh, for moderation of this panel. Thank you so much. Well, a warm welcome, everyone, in this room and also online to this very final panel. The title is Call to Action, Lasting Feminist Peace. So now we will focus on why there is a need to continue to build feminist peace and what is needed from us and also from other important actors to make this happen. My name is Anna Karin Hall. I'm the press officer of Kvinna till Kvinna in Sweden. And uh, before I introduce the panel, I say that we will open up for questions and comments in the end, just as usual. And the panelists for this very last session is they are Tamara Schmidling. Your program officer for Kvinna till Kvinna in Serbia. We have uh, Bojana Ilic, project manager at the Helsinki Citizens Assembly Bosnia Herzegovina. And finally, Dafina Prekazi, your program manager at Kosovo Gender Studies. Well, all of you, I will start with asking every one of you the same question, and I'll start with Dafina. Why we, do you continue to work towards building a feminist peace? Thank you, Anna Karin. Um, hello, everybody. Um, it is so great to be here today and speak in front of all of you. And um, indeed, so much has been said throughout these last days that uh, the things that uh, each of us are going to say in this very concluding and final session is kind of going to be a sort of reaffirmation and confirmation on what we agreed that the road to sustainable peace is. Um, so, um, as most of you know, um, the events that shaped the 90s in Kosovo um, very much actually affected the context in which our societies live now. Our society lives now in Kosovo. And um, this, uh, these events of 90s um, have created this huge residues, or as we feminists like to call, uh, remains, patriarchal remains, um, remains of patriarchy, misogyny, sexism, and huge amounts of nationality and nationalistic uh, structures. And the outcome of these um, uh, nationalistic structures um, is the structural violence, and actually the denial that there is um, structural violence uh, directed to women in Kosovo, but also to other marginalized groups, uh, which consist of half of the population in Kosovo. And so another problem to, that, con that contributed to this rise in nationalism in Kosovo that shapes our society today, I, saw, I see the, um, how our um, justice system was built, because it was a hybrid justice system in a sense that it was uh, held by uh, international missions and international organizations who were based in Kosovo and helped local Kosovars to build justice system from scratch. And so this kind of, um, um, it was problematic for locals because uh, there was all these international standards that needed to apply to the justice system and they had this vision of prolonged justice and peace that they wanted to implement in Kosovo. And so um, this um, led to a really uh, rise nationalism mindset in Kosovo. And to um, give an example, concrete example of this, uh, something that happened last week just before coming in here, there was a discussion going on in, in Kosovo about femicide rates. And um, during 60 days activism last year in 2022, we had this uh, uh, brutal, two brutal cases of murderings of women and women MPs and MPs, uh, members of parliament in Kosovo, say that the femicide does not exist in Kosovo. There is no such thing as femicide in Kosovo. 
And if we continue to say uh, and shout out loud that there is femicide, they say that this is going to make our state look bad in the eye of internationals, and it's going to give a good impression to others. And so you see how this nationalism mindset is actually um, uh, more important to people and is above everything, even above the human rights and the violations that women in Kosovo face um, um, every day. And uh, parallelly, unfortunately, uh, while these discussions are going on, these sexist discussions are going on, uh, there is a very little discussion about the status of women um, who were um, raped and sexually abused during the war in Kosovo. Um, there is little discussion on uh, women's participation in the labor market. Very little discussion about uh, why women in Kosovo has so little property and inheritance rights and why they have so little capital, which is actually um, uh, contributes to, um, increasingly contributes to their um, socioeconomic status. And um, there is this uh, symbolism that, it is, that is attributed to the um, uh, women in Kosovo, that they are these caretakers, caregivers to the elders of the family, to their children, and that all household chores need to be uh, done by women. And so, as I mentioned earlier, this patriarchal remains um, actually really affected women's decision-making in Kosovo and so to say to peace building efforts and processes. And the most important one is the uh, negotiation, negotiation and uh, um, dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia. Uh, women voices, um, women, I mean the absence of women in this process um, has led to uh, important issues to remain silent and unaddressed. unaddressed. And this is the, um, how um, um, sexually violenced um, uh, women and rape have been treated by both parts, by both governments of Kosovo and Serbia, as well as the issue of uh, remains of missing persons. Um, and this is also, it, it continues in happening. And um, just this Saturday in Ohrid, here in North Macedonia, there was this meeting that happened also, uh, my colleague Vetona mentioned in the earliest panel, um, there was a meeting between uh, uh, um, governments of Kosovo and Serbia mediated by uh, EU officials and other internationals. And um, we see when people asked us during throughout these days, they, they, they um, asked us, uh, do you see peace happening? Is it going to uh, this meeting? Will it lead to peace? And our answer was short and we said we don't know. And we don't know because the government, our government, both governments have been um, have had this lack of transparency, they were not direct to their population, to the people, and we don't know if these priorities of women needs and priorities of women are actually discussed on the table. And so this is precisely why we continue to work and build feminist peace, because this male-dominated arena and the male decision makers, decision makers are not taking into consideration or are actually ignoring our priorities, needs, and demands. Yeah, um, thank you, Dafina. The, that reminds me of two things I've heard over these days. Uh, one is that even if a country is in peace, women can still live in constant war. And that's exactly what you described here with uh, ignoring, you know, the femicide. And um, uh, also, <laughs> without women, no peace. That's a saying I hear a lot in the Kvinna de Kvinna partner countries also. Uh, Buryana, so what are your reasons for continuing to build towards feminist peace? Yes, how do we continue to, to build the peace, the feminist peace? First of all, I would like to uh, really thank you all for participating in so many different discussions and panels in the last few days. It's been such an honor to be surrounded with an amazing woman and to exchange so many good practices and to be encouraged and supported. It really means a lot. I would agree in so many different aspects with what Defina mentioned because we do have some same battles that we have to uh, do. Uh, but also uh, coming from Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, I'm also coming from a little bit different context. And how we do continue building a peace, specifically uh, when throughout the history, every 40 to 50 years we had a war. 
We didn't have a generation that lived in peace entirely, so it keeps repeating and repeating. And according to the many psychologists, it's needed 400 years to heal a generation. So it's not just that we have to keep the peace, but we have to assure that it's going to last much more and that we will have generations who will be able to really build healthy societies and uh, basically society where everyone is equal. So how do we achieve that? And I would start from equality, specifically gender equality. I live in Bosnia-Herzegovina where I really don't see women present, not in political life, not in public life, and specifically invisible are women uh, coming from minorities, disabled and so on, Roma women, um, we have to make invisible visible, the ones who are excluded, included, and we have to bring everyone at the table. You know, women are not one, two or three percentage of the entire population. We are half of the population, so we do deserve the half of the table at least. If we see the photographs, for example, from the Dayton Peace Agreement. If you see the, any photo from the peace meetings, the conference meetings, the reforms that are done in Bosnia, I don't find or see a single woman on those photos. So today, for example, we are lucky to have women present in the presidency of Bosnia and chairwoman in the Council of Ministries of Bosnia and Herzegovina, but unfortunately, our last dialogues with them are also showing that they're not really supporting the women's civil society organizations, which means that we as a women's civil society organizations have to make sure our direct participation, that people come to uh, consult us, uh, use our resources, use our expertise, uh, capacities that we have, that's something that we're building uh, from so many different years and experiences, and they should and we have to use it. Thank you, Bayana. That's also, yeah. That's also uh, an old learning for us at, uh, for us at Kvinna till Kvinna, what you're talking about. And that is uh, evidence-based, the fact that more gender equal societies are more peaceful societies. If you advance the gender equality, you will get a more peaceful world to live in. It's so simple. Tamara, you've been... Uh, working for many years. And uh, if you have the longer perspective, why do you think it's still necessary to build towards a feminist peace? Okay, so I will, I will, first I will be very personal. So I'm continuing with this because it is one of the two, maybe three things that I know how to do. And I think I, I, my vision of the world is also a world when we, where we can work what we know and what we like to do. And that's really personal motivation. And of course, the more important is political part of, of that thing, that there is still a huge need for that kind of work, not, not only from, from my side, but you know, really from the, from the wider circle of societies. But then the question is why there is still that need? And I think that there are multiple, multiple answers to that and we can really approach it from different perspectives, but I will just mention a few things. First of all, I think that the structural foundations for wars have never been removed in the world we live in. So we cannot, we cannot think about stopping this kind of work while having these structural foundations that are enabling wars. And when we are talking about peace, I think that we should also tell something about the wars, you know. And I think it is very important for us here to understand that wars do not happen out of blue. You know, it's not just like, okay, two states or, you know, two group of people, they are having some disputes and then suddenly they are in war. It is never like that. So there are some long-term and extensive preparations for war, political, economic, ideological preparations. And I think it is our task also to recognize these preparations. Yes, it would like really. be a weather forecast. Hey, tomorrow is war. 
Uh, oh. <laughs> maybe yeah, that's not the thing out to the blue. Yeah. But you know, maybe yeah. Let's let's say yeah. We should really we should really try to to to, to recognize this preparational phase. Why? Because it is obvious that so far peace efforts uh, have not been successful enough. Although, of course, some battles were won and some significant victories achieved. But globally speaking, you know, we, we failed in changing this uh, deep and comprehensive power relations. And I think that's the main reason why we are still need uh, this, this uh, feminist, feminist uh, peace. And I, I, will, I will also add some other things. But Really, I, I, I have to mention that violence is still the normalized response to many crisis situations on a global level. And we mentioned Ukraine many times, but just to remind us all that, that Ukraine is just one of the wars that we are having at this, at this point. And as long as violence is normalized, we will need some response to that. And of course, I also think that we should be self-critical, maybe the reasons why we are still talking about that, that, that our language wasn't appropriate, our methods were not sufficient and so on. And I think it is important also to self-reflect. But again, do not forget that we are dealing some huge, huge problems and that then our resources are here and the resources on the other, of the other side are there. Yeah, you stole a bit of my next question because you answered it, but I also let the other one. Oh, I also let the other ones answer. It's like you came into this absolutely naturally. Why we are still talking about this? But I'll send it on to Boyana. Why are we still talking about feminist peace after all these years? I think um, if I look at the current situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina and what dialogue we do have now in politician circles, there is nothing about EU integration. There is no dialogue about gender equality. I don't even hear about it in the news even. I, what I can hear is a speech full of hate, full of exclusion. Um, and uh, I, I don't recognize myself there. Uh, so why do we then, uh, how do we further on uh, um, talk about it? Um, there are recently very negative political developments in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and uh, my colleague Alexandra, actually in a previous panel, described it very well. There are two laws um, that are announced that can really affect the media and work of NGO. Recently, the journalist and NGO activist uh, have been attacked, and uh, also the presidents of the entity of Republic of Srpska and the mayor of Banja Luka, the place where I live and work, uh, also have been really negative uh, about some values that are European Union values. So, uh, to be honest, um, going home tomorrow, I don't feel safe. Uh, and I'm not, I might get tired because of it, because all that situation and negative dialogue does make me tired, but I'm not going to stop. And um, I think um, living and working in those kind of conditions, it, it can be, um, it can make us maybe a little bit slower, but we are not giving up from everything that we are fighting. And also, um, I just also want to, um, add that even though we do have upsetting atmosphere, um, that's the reason more why we need the gender equality because in all other countries it shows that gender equality brings development and uh, peace in general. Well, um, it's kind of a depress depressing uh, landscape that you're sketching. Um, uh, and you, well, we are talking about the importance of talking about feminist peace. Uh, Dafina, uh, Linda said in the panel before us, less talking, more action. What do you feel? The need to talk or the, more, uh, the need to act? Um, well, there is definitely a need to act, but also a need to talk. And I'm going to look at this... Um, try to answer this question from a more broader perspective. 
And I, I think I really like the, this highlight that Petra gave in the very first uh, session and in opening a session, which was said that feminist peace is a constant movement. And I think that is so true. It is a constant moving to ever, it is ever changing and ever adapting to different contexts and different uh, um, states and regions across the world. And we are still talking about feminist peace because the um, um, gender inequalities, uh, gender-based violence against women and girls is still so prevalent in most of the regions in, in the world. And, and this is both um, can be applicable to the conflict affected areas, but also post-conflict situations and contexts. And the cascading crisis of the recent years, I think it has brought even more um, um, highlight on the importance of discussing about feminist peace. And um, as we see a right, uh, as we see the rise of the uh, right, uh, right uh, wing domination, uh, the rise of imperialism, of capitalism, um, of the patriarchy, we also see uh, that women's rights are actually moving backwards. And um, I think that the pandemic has also highlighted some things that is so harsh to us, must, might come so harsh to us, but it also an age-told truth that uh, patriarchy uh, roots run deep. And we live in a world-dominated, a male-dominated world and with a male-dominated culture. And I also think that the war in Ukraine and this um, a huge backlash of uh, women's rights and human rights in Afghanistan and Iran taught us a lesson. And that is that our, our peace is so fragile. And what happens in, in, an, in a context, in a different context or in a different country, it will affect us somehow um, across the world. And when we say that we fight for peace, uh, it's not our individualistic fight. We don't say that we fight for our own needs, but we also fight for these um, democratic values, for these universal values and human rights that has also global applicability. So um, um, I think that this is why it's important to continue to, to talk about uh, feminist peace. Tamara, you worked uh, for quite a long time, as I already said. Uh, sorry for repeating. But um, uh, how do you feel uh, like knowing that this has been an ongoing discussion since the 1990s? Uh, how, how do you see this, the need to talk, to continue to talk or to act? Yes, well, I think that I already responded to that. I just want to say something. Uh, for me, uh, discussing and speaking and be outspoken is actually acting. And uh, if we, if somebody disagree with me, that's totally fine. But just try to act without, without ability to talk and to speak out. It would be really difficult. And I think that while we are discussing, while we are talking, while we are sharing, we are also acting. But I, I can also see other, other point of, of that, like for how long shall we just discuss things? When is the time for us actually to, to do something concrete? But for me, it's not either or. For me, those are two parallel processes. And I don't really believe that it is possible to have really strategic, really, uh, really, really thinking, uh, 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 I don't know English word for that, but, the, uh, but some kind of political actions that are, that, that are, really, that are really strategic without first discussing it and, 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 you know, really sharing, not just with people who think like you, but also with unlike-minded people. I think that's, that's crucial. And for me, sometimes it is like, maybe not depressing, but discouraging. Okay, you know, we are having this discussion since 90s, but those are not the same discussions. That is really important because times are changing rapidly and priorities are changing and methods are changing and we are changing, you know, methods of organizing are changing. So I think those are not, those are not same discussions and it is also important to know the history 
of this discussion so that we can build really something new and something that can really make some, some change. So I'm in favor of, <laughs> of discussing, although I'm sometimes I'm tired of that, but I still think that we need more of that and that we need more different people involved in this discussion. And also, as, uh, yeah. and also as uh, uh, panelists in the earlier po panel pointed out, things really take time. Whether you discuss, whether you act, it will take time. 30 years is not really anything in the long run, I guess. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, it's... it's um, uh, I mean, the, the uh, prospect of things getting worse, as you picture it, that's not really good news. Um, one definition of feminist peace that we adhere to at Kvinna till Kvinna is with the following three pillars. One, comprehensive security for all. Two, addressing the root causes of violence and conflict. Three, advancing gender equality. Dafina, if we consider this to be a call for action, and I say that it's absolutely possible to have other definitions, but if we consider this, uh, how can we go forward with this? What are the tools? Yes, um, and these are the very um, core um, uh, definitions of the feminist principle and feminist piece. So I completely agree. And um, if we need to move them forward, um, I think I want to mention that the most important tool or method is education and acknowledging the importance of education. And when I say education, I don't mean just um, putting girls and women in schools and making sure that they actually stay there for a certain period of time. But I, what I mean is that um, they have these um, equal opportunities that derive from attending schools and education and being educated and so that they can contribute equally uh, to um, a more just and gender equal world. But are only girls, only girls need education? Uh, I'm sorry? Are there only girls that need education? No, that's what I wanted to also yeah. add. Um, there's also boys and, and men and women. And when I say also education, I don't mean just education in school, but I just wanted to start with that. It's also awareness raising, um, increasing capacities, enhancing knowledges about the, the different issues and, and gender equality and the importance of women uh, contributing to um, peace processes and peace building. So all of these. And um, secondly, I think that it's also um, important for us to acknowledge that exchange of information, sharing information and good practices is also important, but it's also among ourselves and among different contexts, but it's also uh, intergenerational um, exchange of information. I think this is so important because the women who are living in a war right now, um, they think that um, they are alone, they are suffering alone, and that the thing that they are going through, no one has ever gone through. And so this is important, and safe spaces like this, like this conference and, and, um, uh, and workshops that facilitate this space, uh, safe space, uh, is actually important to motivate women and, uh, and empower them to continue to work for their um, rights. Um, as I said, it's also important intergenerational exchange because I think that uh, we need to include more young voices, more young perspectives into the movement, into the peace building movement. And it's also important to document the women's movement history so that the, it's not forgotten or it's not erased from the collective memory. Um, and thirdly, I want to highlight um, grassroots activism. Uh, personally, I think that this is also one of the most important methods and, and call to action that we need to use. And when I say grassroots f um, activism, I think that we as feminists need to consider that uh, what is happening in the world, what is happening with the global movements, with the global trends related to women's rights and, and backlash or backlash to women's rights, um, it needs to be translated and adapted to the uh, needs of the local woman. And so, um, if we do take an example, for instance, what is happening across a completely different uh, uh, um, 
context, we need to adapt to the needs of the woman. And I think, as an example, a woman in the 90s, woman peace builders, peace activists, did a great job in this. Because at the time, in the 90s, there was no internet, there was no social media, and so the only way to mobilize and to fight for injustices was uh, calling through marches, through protests, through demonstration. And then and the women in 90s in Kosovo did this grass, grassroots activism. Uh, they took this uh, uh, um, global movement of, of calling for protest and calling for help and for, for uh, intervention, while also uh, putting in front the demands and needs of the grassroots women in Kosovo during the 90s. Do you feel that some old school activism might be useful? It might uh, serve as a good practice. But of course, as uh, the time change, also the notion of the feminist and the needs of a woman change. And there is this need for a more pluralistic view and pluralism of, uh, of uh, feminist peace, pluralizing feminist peace. Tamara, your, um, the same question goes to you. Do you have concrete tips? You said, uh, as I understood you, um, talking and acting at the same time. So talking is some kind of concrete acting, but maybe you have some other also. Yeah, I tried to prepare something, you know, just to, to, to give four points that I think maybe they're not crucial, but I think they are important for, for wider feminist movement and for all of those who would like to contribute to building feminist peace. So first of all, I would, I, I would say, we need to take whole picture into account when we are talking about situation of peace in certain society. What I want to say, that problems we deal with are interconnected and, uh, and uh, one really affects the other. So we are not talking about some parallel worlds of gender-based violence, women economic rights and empowerment, uh, women peace and security, uh, feminist peace. Those are all really interconnected, interconnected things. And I think it is really important to follow what is going on in the society uh, that are entering so-called peaceful phase after armed conflict. What I want to say is you can have peace agreement, for example, and that's good and I really wish to all people, all women in the world to, to, to feel that situation as soon as possible, really, to stop armed violence because that's the basic thing, really. That's the thing of, of survival, that's the thing of really our physical bodies and, and where we are. But after that, what, what can happen, like multiple things can happen. And I think it is our feminist responsibility to follow that. For example, you know, infrastructure is destroyed during the war. And after the war, during the so-called peace, you can have, for example, for example, hospitals renovated. But then you can also find yourself in a situation that those hospitals are not for anyone anymore, but for those who can pay because legislation changed in the meantime. And we were so focused, of course, on our survival when we were focused on that wish to end the, 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 the uh, armed violence. But then, you know, there are many things that are going on, you know, even during the war and after the war. And I think that we should be really, we should be really um, monitoring that because it is crucial for for, for later development of that society and for the position of a woman there. And I will just briefly mention uh, 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 a few more things, but really briefly. I would say, uh, let's not be sectarian orientated. Let's be the broader political partnership with all progressive and emancipatory forces in our societies. You know, I think it is, it is really crucial and we are talking about women and we are talking about feminists, but I also want to say that I need also my, my male friends. I need my partner to help me build a different world. I need also, you know, another half of our society to be, to be our, our allies in, in, in that struggle. So I would say really, really let's build this broader, this broader uh, political partnership, of course not with, with anyone because we cannot do that, but with, with those who are progressive and emancipatory forces. Let's politicize our work. The biggest misconception about peace building work is that it is possible to engage with this kind of work and be neutral in terms of values and politics. That's simply not possible. 
you know, it is not possible, there is no such thing as neutrality or, you know, value-free position when it comes to this. And I think that it is important for us to be aware of that and to politicize our, our work. And then I will also mention education, but maybe in a slightly different way, political education. Let's educate ourselves politically. Let's really understand how the state functions, you know, how institutions function. What can we change? What cannot we, we cannot change? What we can transform and some things we cannot transform. I think it is really, really important and to really understand that educational work is crucial part of peace building work. You know, and sometimes it is forgotten or, you know, we value more some other, some other kind of activities. But so let's not forget political education. We all need it. It's like the uh, European Union ha has that uh, uh, long, life, uh, long, life learning. long life learning or something like that. So let's apply that to, to this and let's, let's use that concept because it is really something that we need. Yes, what you mentioned there, Tam Tamara, in the beginning is so very important. S yes, you wished ceasefire for anyone, I guess, but what you also wished was a peace that is engendered, that takes into account the need of women and the building of a new society that does not take in the need of women and their perspective then it will not lead to real peace. At least it's what I, my perception is. Uh, Bojana, what are your tips? Um, before, I would just like to mention something because we had so many negative news from Bosnia Herzegovina and I remembered something. Um, Dafina mentioned the importance of education both to girls and boys and in Helsinki Citizens Assembly recently we had so many male students coming to us and asking to be part of the gender equality education and they completed, they've been part of really important analysis and really important allies to us being very publicly open open and fighting for their sisters and uh, girlfriends and mothers and, and future daughters as well. And I think I really wanted to mention this because their support means a lot. It's not, it should not be only on our shoulders. They should take part of the work as well. And also Tamara mentioned so many important tools. Um, so I will not really mention any kind of practical tools. But I would say that it's really important to keep showing up and to keep going, even if it's really, really hard. Um, I think Nemo described it well, just keep swimming. And to <laughs> uh, not forget uh, that we should be present in so many different uh, life aspects. There are so many women who are at this moment defending rivers, standing on our side. So many, yeah, women who are... <laughs> So many, so many women who are working behind the curtains, their work is not maybe visible, but we should appreciate that, we should value that. There are women upstairs uh, taking care of our rooms, making much life easier for all of us, for both men and women. So let's appreciate that, let's thank to them, let's showing up and keep swimming. Yes. You're touching upon something that Cynthia Enlow, that was in the starting panel uh, for this conference, also said that you have to listen to all the other women that are around us. What are their experiences of the society? What the women that are cooking, that are cleaning when they are in the war, what's their experience? If we don't include, if we don't have this inclusiveness, with all the women and of course, we need all groups to come together and uh, because you mentioned Tamara, we can't build peace without men. We can't, I mean, we can't, if we don't get them on the train with this solution, I mean, we will have half a society doing something else. Uh, Dafina, if we come to this like uh, peace, feminist peace building as a concept, uh, sometimes you can get the perception it's like one size fits all. Um, 
is it possible to understand the needs and priorities of women in different countries in the Western Balkans? Is it like similar across all the states when you build peace? Um, from, from all the speakers and from all the panelists that we have throughout these last days, and also the conversations, one-on-one -on -one conversations with each other, uh, we kind of saw some similarities and we kind of understood each other on what are our, um, our issues that we're facing in our countries. And um, this is specifically um, important for the context of Western Balkans because with the, um, with the, with the uh, forms of structural violence and corruption and um, historical um, um, marginalization of gender and ethnicity, we saw so many similar, uh, similarities. Um, this was also, in my case, I also saw some similarities with um, a woman that I met here for the first time from other contexts, uh, context from other countries. And um, despite having these, um, uh, despite being some commonalities on issues and understanding each other, um, I think that um, it is important to acknowledge that um, each community and each country has its own unique um, experiences and difficulties face. So exactly this uh, one size uh, does not fit all, does not fit all comes into uh, the perspective. So what might work for Kosovo, for instance, for women in Kosovo might not work necessarily for women in Iran or Afghanistan. But what is important to mention is that um, sustainable peace can only be achieved if um, multi-dimensional uh, aspects and experiences of women in everyday context are actually um, is taken into consideration and be applied in peace building efforts. Bojana, is there a, 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 like, um, a risk of division and, and weakening the cause if we work very differently with feminist peace? I wouldn't say that there is a risk. I mean, we will take different approaches because we are coming from so many different countries. Just thinking that Bosnia has a free president, I don't know, I don't even count how many governments and so on. So we do need different approaches. We do need those different diversity uh, approaches, but we have the same goal. So in the end, we will come at the same place. We might take different paths uh, up to it, but um, you know, just uh, taking our ways, fighting for the same goal, and in the end, we will meet at the same point, hopefully. Um, so I think that's important, and I'm completely not afraid of taking different approaches to achieve the result. Tamar, your thoughts on this? Is it uh, okay to carry out feminist peace differently in the region as Western Balkans? Not just okay, but needed. I will just support everything that Tafina and Boyana, Boyana said here. I would say, uh, really, uh, uh, no uh, one-size-fits-all uh, solution. It has to be really, uh, uh, really adjusted to the specific local context, and that's the point. I mean, that's the that's the core of feminist peace. And we are working. I think that there is no there is no uh, risk of of uh, uh, fragment, uh, uh, fragmenting the, the, the movement in that way because we should work on the same principles based on same values, but of course to adjust our approaches and methods and the language and everything to the concrete local context. And not just local, on, on a state, national level. For example, what is needed in Priedor, in Bosnia and Herzegovina is one thing, and then Mitrovica in Kosovo is another. So, uh, or in Bosnia and Herzegovina, Mostar is one story, and, and, and I don't know, Banja Luka is, is different story. So I think that localization that we already discussed this morning is really crucial here. Yes, and uh, there may be some basic principles, like the one I suggested earlier, that we can agree on, but there might also be a need for thinking uh, in other directions or in other paths. But this is, you know, the $100 million question. Dafina, how do we know that feminist peace works? Well, there is an, an important and interesting question, and I think this should be directed to also all the audience. 
and it serves as a food for thought. But how I'm going to answer this question is um, with what we know for certain and for sure. And that is that um, the male domination in peace building efforts and in, in, uh, in advancing peace and um, have been monopolized by men for more than 30 years, at least in the context of Kosovo and Serbia, and um, they have failed. And they are still failing, and they will probably continue to fail because our voices and our, our needs and our priorities are not being taken into consideration. And um, what is important to mention is that uh, we, uh, women peace builders, um, in Kosovo, in northern Kosovo, in southern Serbia, um, have achieved to build this dialogue among ourselves, this sustainable dialogue, this um, understanding among each other, and this sustaining peace. And this is something that no uh, man politician have achieved to do so in the last 30 years uh, in both countries. Tamara, what do you tell people that say that there is absolutely no evidence that this toolbox of feminist peace works? I, I really like that question. <laughs> and I, I say, what I always say, yes, of course, you're right. There is no evidence. But you know, there is evidence that all these other toolboxes simply do not work. So why don't we give a chance to this feminist toolbox and then see what could possibly go wrong? I mean, that's really, that's really... <laughs> Thank you, you are the best audience. <laughs> No, really, but whenever somebody, somebody asks that, it's like, okay, all these, all other approaches prove to be really successful, and now the only problematic is feminist, feminist approach, so you know we have to test it in advance, we have to prove it without even testing it that it will work. Come on, you know, we have like a bunch of evidence that many other approaches simply didn't work for different reasons. Let's try this one. I mean, really, let's try this one, and then, then, then gi let's give it a chance, and then we will see. And then we can sit and really discuss what, what uh, uh, possibly went wrong, why, and, and things like that. I, th I think we are, we are adults, and we are not sharing fairy, ta fairy tales here. And of course, that there are many, many, you know, uh, unknown things. Uh, many, many, you know, it, it, this is territory that, that you know, m many things can, can, can go in unexpected ways. But I don't really see major risks for our society from applying feminist peace, only benefits. Well, Weana, uh, when you meet someone that says, oh, feminist peace, it's like utopian ideas. Oh, we, we can try that. It sounds like, you know, it, it's, it's not realistic. Well, what <laughs> uh, I would say, look at the countries um, that are actually really good in achieving feminist peace. Look at the countries with very high um, gender index. Look at the countries with, who are really good in achieving gender equality. Those are really prosperous countries. Democracy works, the economy works. So if the gender equality is a good recipe to achieving all these things, why we don't try it out? I think it's, it's simple as that, because we were trying the opposite things and the opposite uh, politics for so many years, and it obviously doesn't work. So why we don't take this approach? And also, for those people who, who, who are thinking that it's not possible to do it, I would say that they are um, using the finances and the budgets uh, where both men and women are equally participating by giving taxes. So then also women deserve to, you know, to, to, to have benefits equally from those things. And that's something we should strive for. Uh, uh, so we should, you know, we should give it a try uh, uh, and see what happens. Yeah, and even if it should fail the first time, thinking about the other solutions to problems that have failed so many times, as you mentioned, the patriarchal way of doing things, 
So at least the feminist piece should get not the one, but two, three, four, five, ten chances, I think. It will probably succeed the first time, at least that's what I hope. Um, well, um, Tamara, if you had the opportunity to send messages to important stakeholders, and some may listen to us right now, what would you say? messages about feminist peace. It can be high, it can be low. Let me try. Yeah. I don't know. I, I would say, first of all, that, that further militarization and arming and spending money of, of buying weapons and uh, uh, further divisions into different military blocks are by no means an option for, for, for the world. I think it's, it's, not, it's not a good way. And I also th think that no group of people anywhere in the world really should be cannon fodder in the competition of those great and powerful. And I just think that, that it, it, should, it should stop, first of all. Then I think that my, the violence must be stopped urgently by insisting on negotiations and peaceful solution. I think that that's really, really I mean, it, it, it seems self-explanatory, but in, 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 in today's world, it, it is a really like important message, I think. It should be repeated, come on. The only way really to solve this is negotiation and peaceful solutions, no militarization and no going deeper and deeper and deeper in the war. I would also say one more thing. Let's finally adopt the lessons learned from previous conflicts. I mean, we also have a bunch of them. And they are not just in our heads. They are well documented in different documents, resolutions, reports. So let's really start using the accumulated knowledge and lessons learned from the thousands of, of, of pages already produced. And I would also tell to those people that they have really power to keep all those paper from being just dead letters on, on, on paper, that they can, they have power really to make these voices heard. And it is important because there are many, many things there. And I'm not sure if nobody ever read that. What we, we are doing with, with all these, all these lessons, while, while we are re really keeping on with the same old mistakes with this arrogant, you know, approach to different, different societies, different parts of the world, like it happened for the first time. No, this is not the first time, you know. We already, we, we have seen it. And also, you know, I would, I would, I would say that uh, uh, it, is, it is really important that all these concepts that we are talking about, peace and dialogue, you know, and trust building and bridge building. Sometimes, because we, we are repeating them so, so, so many times, sometimes they, they sound like, like empty shells, like there, there, is no, there is no content, there is no real meaning. So it is really, it is really responsibility, partly our responsibility, but also of people in power of decision makers to really give, to bring back some real content to this to these concepts and, and, uh, and uh, to take responsibility really to that. And I, I will finish with that. I will also, you know, send that, that message that, you know, they should demonstrate the same level of responsibility and ethics that is expected from us local peace actors. So I think that is, that is really, really important. Same level of responsibility and the ethics for the state of humankind at this, at this moment. That's um, Bujana, you have a chance now to address people that have the power. What would you say? What should they start doing? One thing I heard earlier here when we talked was like, yes, they could start by opening our emails with all the important information that we have, with all the solutions that we can provide. Just please read. But what more do you have? Well, besides opening our emails, finally, um, really inviting us to the table, consulting us, uh, taking our experiences, taking our resources that we have, 
we as women civil society organizations, we truly present the EU values. We are the ones who fight for it. Hopla. I feel like this an attack. <laughs> I think you said something really powerful there. <laughs> must, be, must have been it. So uh, I just want to check, uh, just one moment. Are we still online with the sound? And is everything working? I get a, I get a thumbs up. Okay, Boyana, I think you should uh, start, like, back up a little. Okay, so uh, let's continue from opening our emails, <laughs> consulting us, inviting us, taking our opinions uh, in consideration, our resources and everything. I already mentioned we are really presenting the EU values, so much fighting for the EU integration. We should be partners for peace dialogue, not the guys, the same guys I'm watching on TV for 20, 30 years, and I don't see results at all. So please, we are you know, just offering our knowledge, offering our hands, our experiences, that should be really used. And uh, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we can together build much better society. That would be my key message and uh, do not disappoint us. I'm, I'm uh, expecting invitation. <laughs> Dafina, what are your key takeaways to the people holding the power? Um, yes, I also have some direct messages, some key takeaways in form, of, in form of the messages, more personal messages. And what I would say, and I say, is that we women activists, we peace builders, are uh, your true allies. And we are the one that work with grassroots women, with grassroots uh, marginalized group, and we are the one that know their needs and their priorities uh, and their demands. And as Boyana already said, we are actually the one that also fight for your, to promote your, your European values, the universal values, the human rights values. And um, uh, we know what we want. Uh, we know what women and marginalized groups want, and um, we have the means to do what we want. Uh, we have the methodologies, the recommendations, everything ready. And what we need for you is to consider us as your true allies and give your um, technical tailored support and not disappoint us along the way. And I also wait to have some replies on my email. Uh, list tomorrow when I get back to work as well. I mean, isn't that a fantastic offer? Someone did all this work and it's just ready. It's just, you know, to pick it up and use it. And as we have some time left, I will now ask you a final question that I didn't prepare you for but I'm sure you can respond. Why do you, Tamara, think there is such a firm resistance to feminist peace? I think there is a firm resistance to, to feminism in general, first of all, and it, it says a lot, I mean, about our society. And then one thing that it says, I think, that they really see us as uh, important important actor. When it comes to feminist peace, I must say that I don't see such a firm resistance, but more of a confusion. Wow. What is that? Like ignorance or uninterest? Uh, lack, of, uh, lack of interest, uh, for sure, then confusion. What does it mean and how the feminist peace is different from like regular peace, so to say. But, you know, I think that it is partly also our responsibility to really arti articulate it better and promote it, promote it wider. But I think that fierce resistance really, really exists in, in this contemporary world when it comes to feminism, because I think that, that uh, feminism has been recognized as one of the main threats to all these conservative, rightist, really backward values and of course you know if they recognize you as a as a real threat then they will attack you and they will fiercely oppose anything that you pro 
propose, including feminist peace. But I still think that our responsibility is to be better articulate and, and you know, to be, to be uh, uh, clearer with the concept of feminist peace and possible benefits of feminist peace for our society. Yes, sometimes it says like learning is also repeating, repeating, repeating over again. What is pem feminist peace until people in power understand? Buyana, what do you say? Why is there uh, a lack of, if you, we call it confusion, or lack of interest in feminist peace? I think because um, a lot of people is afraid to lose the power. I think on the first session we mentioned that the quality is opposite to power, so they're really afraid to lose the power. And uh, I mean, why shouldn't they? Look at us, we are so powerful and beautiful and we bring the, the, the new <laughs> lives on this earth. So, I mean, I would be afraid. <laughs> so, so I think that's the reason why they're so resistant, but uh, not for too long, I would say, not for too long. Yeah, look how then years we are sitting up here and being all women in the room. Oh, God, I, I'm so scared. Well, Dafina, uh, what would you say? What are you, what's your analysis? I think there is resistance because they are afraid of us. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm actually just kidding, but I wanted to relate to what Bojana is saying. Um, I think there is some kind of maybe not exactly resistant, but there is some kind of intimidation from the word itself, feminism, because people are afraid um, of the word and the very notion and the meaning of feminism. But little do they know that actually feminism is actually um, this universal uh, meaning of including um, everyone in the table and even the ones that are most marginalized. And so, um, I think that's about more about the intimidation rather than resistance. Well, I think uh, it's about time that we open up for questions and can also be comments, reflections. And also, uh, you, our guests online, you're also welcome. And you then will write in the Q&A uh, on the Zoom and not in the chat. We have one question first in the room and then one question online. Please go ahead. I think you got a microphone. Please present yourself also. Uh, hello. My name is Albulena Caraga. I'm a feminist peace activist. I've been working on, uh, to say the least, gender sensitive peace building, but I prefer feminist peace building because I find it more adequate and more uh, true because I think. Uh, from a position as someone that's been working uh, in peace building, that peace building is inherently feminist. And if it isn't, I don't think it is peace building. And I find it to be inherently feminist because at the core of every relation, uh, there is gender. Because on the way that our societies, but also globally, raise girls and boys, and the expectations that our societies have of what a true woman or a true man should be are deeply uh, ingrained and related to what sort of uh, relations then are translated into different uh, areas. So if we, uh, on one hand, as societies, uh, raise uh, girls and women to give birth to the next soldiers, and raise uh, boys into becoming uh, men who will fight the next uh, war, it's absolutely the work of, of peace building to at least make this a topic. Because militarization and patriarchy go hand in hand, and militarization and patriarchy are one of the core topics with which peace building uh, should deal with. Uh, peace building and feminism both boil down to justice. Is this fair? And if it isn't, what do I do about it? What is my responsibility? And what is my power or lack of, therefore? So I find both uh, feminist, feminism and peace building 
to be inclusive, or at least have the tendency to be inclusive, to be tailor-made, based on also in line with what Tamara and Afina have been talking during this uh, last uh, session, uh, contextualized and adapted for local needs, conscious about intersectionality and power dynamics, and also both have in common non-patronizing solidarity. We keep talking how we should be there about each other, and absolutely we should. But we also need to be conscious about our privileges and in which areas are we discriminated, in the ways of how we seek solidarity and how we offer uh, solidarity. I probably am forgetting other things, but uh, it boils down to, for me, creating more just and more fair societies. That's the job of, of peace building and that's the job of feminism. And to me, they're inherently interrelated. I really don't think there can be a non-feminist peace building. That's all. Anyone in the panel that want to respond to that? Tamara, you spoke earlier about uh, feminist peace building, how it differs from, you know, just peace building. So maybe you have some idea on that. No, I, I agree totally with Albula and I 100%. It, I just mentioned that as a question that I, uh, I receive from time to time, how feminist peace is different from peace, you know, or things like that. But I, I agree 100% with what, what, so I don't want to, to, to repeat and take more time. Any of other of you? No, you can, there's no such thing as masculine peace building. What could that be? <laughs> okay, take the next question from uh, our, uh, one of our online guests. Yeah. So we have a comment from an activist from North Macedonia and it reads, I would like to follow up on the issue with Daphina. It's also very important that girls, boys, women and men from rural areas are included. And that is that the right information reaches them, including education, focus groups, trainings and workshops to be sufficiently strengthened in this matter because they are isolated from a lot of information. Thank you. I think that resonates with what both of you said earlier. And as, as we view education as this access towards equal opportunities, to um, economic opportunities, to decision making, and to building this um, sustainable peace that is equal to all and for all. Yeah, I, I can just really agree. Uh, we also mentioned some of those things previously, so completely agree. Yes, uh, we have one question from Hadil, but there is someone else ahead of you. Ja ću malo da se pomerim u stranu. Ne volim žaden kad se okreću nazad. Can you give uh, uh, hold, hold on a minute so we can put on? I želim da stanem ispred vas i samo da vam kažem nešto. Ovo je jedna sugestija. Ovo je poruka žena sa severa uh, Mitrovice, upućene Kvini Telkvini. E, I zamolila su im da im prenesem ovako, pošto je mirovna konferencija, a, e, zahvaljujući Kvini Telkvini, e, Sever e, je e, počeo da se e, spaja s albanskom zajednicom. E, ja sam morala prvo da izučim Sivije i Stine i Petre i svih da bi mogla njima da objasnim ko je donator jer bilo je toliko nepoverenje, imaju poverenje samo da rade sa njima. A nešto što je najbitnije, ovaj, e, mogu da vam kažem sad isto kad smo bili u Ohridu, i uvek kad se nešto desi, oni kažu meni ovako, šta kaže Vetone, a šta kaže Kvina? Kao da ja mogu da im dam te, ne, te neke odgovore, a odgovore šta kaže Vetone, mogu da im dam, ali šta kaže Kvina, ja zaista ne mogu da im dam. To je to neko poverenje koje su one stekli u Kvinu. Ja se zahvaljujem Kvini što je podržala Sever, što je Sever prihvatio njih, što su oni bile te koje su potrebe, i složila bih se sa Dafinom, retorika Severa, retorika Mitrovice je ružna, e, e, politička retorika je odvrtna. I sama Dafina zna isto kao i ja da mi više 
živimo na aparatima za disanje, da nam su potrebne pumpice. Mi svakodnevno sebi sami dajemo kisonik, kad se probudimo ne znamo kako ćemo i šta ćemo. To je bila poruka iz Ohrida, bile smo u subotu u Ohrid, Vetona kao naš izvršni direktor, a ja bih imala običaj da kažem prva među jednakima, jer mi smo tim, Kvini da više ne menja logo, jer sam trebala danima da objašnjavam na participant listu zašto je Kvina promenila logo i da li je to isto ostala Kvina, da, zato što neće žene, to je činjenica, to je istina, nažalost, USA, nažalost, mislim ja sam direktna uvek, ja ću ja kažem, na sever osim Kvine, Što se tiče severa, da Fina to sigurno isto zna, upućeno je u to. Ne može ni jedan donator, ne postoji šanse da može da krene, ma kakva god izgradnja mira bila, ma kakvi god konflikti bili, ma šta god da se desi osim kvine. Kvina je kvina i kvina ostaje kvina i ja bih zamolila kvinu i zahvalila se za sve ove godine što su nas podržali, što su naše potrebe prepoznali, vola bi da nam daju podršku da počnemo i mi da radimo sa muškarcima. Isto i ja ne smem da vam otkrijem nešto što smo mi integrisali, što radimo nešto što ne možemo da otkrijemo ali je jako dobro, doći će momena da ćemo da vam kažemo i da ćete da znate na što smo ja i Vetona i naš tim ponosni. Hvala vam puno, hvala svim ženama. Zahvaljujem se u ime žena Severa, s obzirom da su one jako teške za integraciju, jako neprihvatljivo uopšte. Imala da vam prenesem jednu molbu vama kao timu kvine kompletnom jer sam im obećala da ću to da vam kažem. Oni žele da se sretnu sa vama. Da vi morate da nađete, morate. Znači, žene nikad ništa ne moraju, ali oni su rekli da vam prinesem da morate da nađete vremena, da dođete, da one žele da razgovaraju sa vama, da one žele da upoznaju vas i da se one vama na svoj način zahvale, što su posle 20 godina našle svoje drugarice Albanke i što se druže i što zajedno rade radionice. Hvala vam puno, izvinite na vremenu. Dafina, Dafina, I uh, missed the first part of the message, but you understood, didn't you? No, I actually acknowledged... Oh, you also had... Uh, yeah, I, I acknowledged the work that women organizations are doing in both north of... I mean, in Mitrovica, north of Mitrovica, but also in south Serbia. And I said that uh, they are doing a great job in creating this dialogue and maintaining this sustainable peace that men have failed doing for many decades now. So I think that's the message that they were referring to. <laughs> mm. Yes, and I also heard uh, that you were very grateful towards Kvina Ti Kvina and our work, and yet you appreciated that very much, and that really warms my heart. Um, and I'm sorry, I didn't get all the translation, uh, so I cannot summarize the whole message, but I think the key things came with you there. I think, Hadil, you raised your hand. So thank you so much, uh, Tamara and all the panelists. I just like want like uh, ask you a question uh, based on the 30 years of the experiment that you passed through. Did you like um, see that women peace and security agenda, the whole? like failed to respond to our need and how we can, uh, and your need, I mean, and how we can like, you know, uh, use the women peace and security agenda to enhance the feminist peace. I hope my question is clear. Yeah, thank you. Well, who of you wants to respond that? 
to that. Did you hear the question? Well, how did you find that the Women, Peace and Security agenda helped you advance feminist peace? Maybe I can start, if that is okay. Um, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, there is a lot of discussion about women, peace, and security because it seems that it led to kind of militarization of the having more women in military service, but not really serving to the full uh, uh, aim. And so there are really different opinions and discussions. We still don't have answer, unfortunately. Um, but we, we do try to find the, the, the best solution to, to work towards the implementation. Tamara? I will try to answer very briefly. Uh, yes, the, the, the whole, whole agenda and the, the, the resolution 20, 1325 and all the following documents were harshly criticized by feminist movement in, in, in our part of the world, mainly because of the way it was co-opted by uh, state, state institutions and how basically uh, it lost its original purpose. And, uh, uh, but I think that we should value the process of that and then we, th that's just one of the things that we should reclaim somehow. And for example, concept of security, we should reclaim together with many other concepts. And just be clear, you know, that our understanding of security really doesn't lie in this militaristic understanding of, ha of having more women in the military or more women in police forces. I mean, that's not the point. Concept of security is much wider than that. And I think that we should reclaim that, uh, but, you know, we, we, we should also offer, you know, alternatives and we should really offer clear responses to what does it mean, concept of security for us. So, yeah, I would say that we should really stick to, to this kind of feminist critique because in Serbia it's, re, it, it's on the very bottom of interest of, of, of uh, our national authorities. Like, it is really, it is really not priority for them at all, but it doesn't mean that we should give up that, but we should really constantly remind all of us that we will never accept that understanding and that notion of security, which tells us, okay, army is here to protect your, your security, or, you know, it's not, it's, 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 it's so, 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 uh, so bigger than that. I think and it is important for us really to, to reiterate that message all, all over again. Um, yeah, I'm also going to add this perspective, um, the same as my uh, um, colleague said. Um, I think that the importance of women peace security agenda is actually acknowledging uh, the importance of women's inclusion in peace building efforts, and this was um, as the first step, and I attribute this to the long-term advocation of women's rights organizations, international organizations, and their advocacy. But um, in Kosovo as well, there is a dialogue among feminists and women's rights activism, whether women peace security agenda was, has achieved its final goal. Um, and so um, if you look at the history of women peace security agenda, and even if we look at its subsequent um, sister resolutions, we see that even the women peace security agenda is evolving. And so there is always this need to add and pluralize the agenda and the meaning of peace and security. So that's my interpretation. Okay, we have time for one final question or comment, if there is any. Oh, I think everyone got. Oh, yes, we have one more. You'll soon get the microphone. And um, please introduce yourself. Pozdrav do panelistkita. Ima istrpni govori i pozdrav do sita členovi na konferencijata. Sakam za ova posljednoto vo vrska so agendata mirot i bezbednosta. Јас дојдам од Свети Николе, од граѓански иницијатива на жени. Меѓутоа, членка сум и на регионалното женско лоби за мир, стабилност и правда, која што работи регионално. И имаме доста активности во сите земји, посебно во Косово, 
за имплементацията на Брисълскиот договор. Меѓутоа, она што не поврзува и сакам да го пренесам како искуство, е тоа дека ние, како невладени организации, мора да се поврзиме со жените политичарки, мора да се поврзиме со жените новинарки, мора да се поврзиме со жените уметнички и други, ако сакаме да го градиме мирот и феминистичкиот мир. Исто така, оснажувањето на жените или јакнењето на жените на локално ниво и од долу нагоре е многу битно за да ја постигнеме онаа цел на која што сакаме да, да бидеме. Бидејќи ја спомнавме резолуцијата 1325, тоа е наш устав на жените која шо во него е вметнато све, тргнувајќи од економскиот мир, од образовниот мир на жените. Значи, тоа е само како поидовна точка која што ние понатаму треба да го градиме и да го постигнеме. Она не викаме миритаристичкиот мир, него сакаме да постигнеме нешто кое што викаме феминистички мир. И тоа одиме по тој пат. Меѓутоа, оди тешко, Бидејќи ево ние во Македонија, можам, морам да кажам дека учеството на жените е многу битно. Значи, треба да ги мотивираме, да ги а, мобилизираме за да се вклучат, тргнувајќи од руралната жена, па се до жените политичарки. Бидејќи, ако тргнеме од жената рурална, ќе видиме дека тие се додека не контактираме со нив да ги собереме, да ги мобилизираме, тие си работат некоја своја работа и сметат дека така треба да биде. Од патриархат, од повлечени. Меѓутоа, кога ги вклучиме, веќе тие се активираат, сакат да влезат во местни заедници, сакат да влезат во управни одбори, сакат да се вклучат во политиката. И тоа е она кој што ние сите треба да го работиме, бидејќи сите како феминистки успеавме нели, квотите и соработка да а, меѓу државите во регионот. А, во, скоро во сите од државите успеавме да дојдеме до одредени квоти кои сакаме да ги унапредиме нели, до она која што не е крај на цел 50% жени. Меѓутоа во Македонија не успеавме да дојдеме до квоти градоначалнички или, да речеме, во извршната власт. Таму каде што е мокта, таму каде што се парите, каде што се буджетите, таму не успеавме барем до сега. Сега имаме само две градоначалници. И тоа е едно учеството или резолуција да 1325. Исто така, со работката регионална на невладените организации, на градоначалничките, на пратеничките, е основа да го сакаме да одиме напред, а исто така, процесот на евроинтеграцијскиот процес или европските вредности да ги донесеме кај нас, само така можеме да идеме напред. Инаку се уште талкаме како Западен Балкан, се уште имаме последици од војната и од корупцијата, криминалот кој што цвета скоро во сите земји во регионот. Благодарам. Yes, I should try to summarize this. Um, uh, what was said was that we all need to connect more with women, uh, like the NGOs uh, that are working with women's issues need to connect more with women in the media, women in the politics. Uh, uh, we can talk about economic peace, and we can talk about educational peace, and we can talk about everything we want to achieve. But what we really need to do is to mobilize women from the grassroots level on the ruler in the rural areas and up uh, to the women in politics if we do not do that the patriarchy will think that this is the way it should be so even though uh, we in north macedonia have succeeded in certain quotas when it comes to women's political participation on some levels it has not been done on the local levels um, and uh, also that if uh, we want 
to uh, bring forward uh, like the European values uh, more here in the country, we really must do and uh, you know talk about them because there are a lot of problems in uh, the country with uh, criminality and um, corruption and that. Yes, it was a comment to uh, the fact, and I think you also touched upon that in the panel, that uh, you have to mobilize you know, people on all levels. Otherwise, uh, simply, sorry, simply want, uh, we, we won't be able to uh, go forward with anything. Well, I will uh, let those be almost the last words. I want to finish with something that was said in uh, one of the sessions I attended this week. Uh, people should list successes for feminist peace, and someone wrote this, and I think it just nails it. A success is we are still here, and we are still fighting. Thank you very much to this panel, Tamara Schmidling. Bojana Ilic and uh, Dafina Prekazi. And to all of you in the room and to all of you that have participated online. And now we will have some final remarks from our Secretary General. No, first something from, sorry. Yeah, we need to finish. We started, so we need to finish. <laughs> So yeah, it's, uh, it's almost the final, final end of the, of the Family Peace Conference. Thank you, Anna and Dafina and Boena and Tamara for this, uh, for this very uh, fruitful discussion. Um, yes, we, we will hand over to our Petra uh, uh, Totterman and Ander for, for the final words. Uh, but before that, uh, I will give uh, the word to my colleagues and we will invite you for one activity after uh, Petra's speech. Exactly, thank you. Buena. so before we officially finalize uh, the conference with uh, Petra's addressing, we would truly like to thank you for this amazing journey over the past three days. Thank you so much to all the panelists, to the moderators, and to the audience who have contributed significantly to the entire conference. And at the same time, we would also like to uh, thank to all the people who took fantastic care of the logistics, our colleagues, but also the technicians, and of course the interpreters who have made the communication and understanding each other possible. So a big applause for everyone. Thank you once again, and Petra, over to you. as your te technical leader. <laughs> Seems that this is where I'm falling every time. Okay, so thank you, thank you, thank you. I have now the honor uh, of giving a few closing remarks. We're really getting to the end of three long days, so I won't be long. Uh, it's been incredibly inspiring. Uh, there have been discussions and meetings and exchange of ideas and experience and stories and thank you so much for this last panel uh, and the amazing job I think that you did, I think we all do, in summarizing so many of the difficult conversations that we've had and I personally also feel that we have come rather far from where we started only, you know, uh, two days ago. And it is clear that we still have a lot more work to do uh, in achieving lasting feminist peace. So I will build a little bit on what you said, you know, and give some last words. And the first thing that I take with me is that we, and now I identify m myself and Kvinna to Kvinna as part of the women's movements working for peace, that we already have what is needed uh, for a better future. 
we have the solutions, we have the answers, and we have the practices. And collectively, we have produced checklists for how to design inclusive peace processes. We have produced manuals for how to reform peace building financing systems. We have recommendations for how to counter shrinking democratic space. We have best practices for how women's work for human rights and peace should be done. And we have reports and reports and reports. And so does Kvinna to Kvinna as well. So we do not need any more innovative approaches, as has been said. Let's try the feminist version and try it once and for all. And maybe we need to try it five or ten times, but let's try it because it hasn't been done. And we need support, we need recognition and funding for the work that is already being done, but it's too little. So we do the work and we will keep on doing the work and we are changing the world every day. And if we are better supported, invited, <laughs> included, the emails are read, uh, I am certain that there is no limit to that change. And if international donors and institutions, if you don't want your political support and funding to be in vain, you should really listen to the Women Human Rights Defenders for, and the Activists for Lasting Feminist Peace. So basically the message to international donors is to paraphrase Nike, just do it. And the second thing I take with me uh, so that's the first thing, that we already have the answers. Uh, and the second thing I take with me from these days, and this is really truly from my heart, uh, it is the importance of us doing it together. Uh, nothing is fun unless you do it together. And, you know, to find the unity in the, the diversity that we have talked so much about, uh, and the importance of always working for inclusive security for all. And Alexandra, I don't know where you are right now. Yes, there you are. You said it in the suffocating panel. When we are together, there's nothing to be afraid of. I wrote that down. I will take that with me. And we started the conference with Cynthia Enloe, and I said it then, and I say it now, she's my heroine. <laughs> I find her amazing. Uh, so I would like to end uh, and send, you know, and, and send us off with some of her words of wisdom. And that is to never be the most feminist person that you know, because that's not going to get you far. You need to have people around you who are differently feminist or more feminist than you are. It's only depressing if you're doing it all by yourself. So once again, thank you to everyone who has participated here uh, in these rooms and halls. Thank you to you who participated online. And of course, once again, a huge thank you to the organizers, the team that have put it together, the translators, everyone who has worked so hard to make these days comfortable here. And uh, final, a promise from all of us at Kvinna till Kvinna. We will continue to keep showing up. Because if we are doing this together, then change will come. So that is a promise that we will continue to show up. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Petra. See, I got a touch to the mic, so I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult to get rid of it. Very final thing, we would like to have a group photo, so everyone who would like to join us, please stay here for a few more minutes to do the photo. Thank you.